Jackie Franchuli, the publisher of Wahoo's 24-7 and host of Good Old Podcast, is our special guest. It's time for a Virginia football preview. This is ACC Nation. That's Will Ogenet. I'm Jim Quist. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. It's always fun to be on here. You've had some time to look back. The departure of Mendenhall, the scramble to find the right person to move the Cavaliers forward, the hiring of Tony Elliott and staff, promises for improved facilities and spring practice, and of course, all the flurry of recruits that are going on here as of late. With uh, the benefit of some 2020 hindsight, give us a history lesson, a synopsis, if you will, of what all that means from your vantage point for the progression of Virginia football. Sure. So there's a lot of stuff that's been going on the last few months. Obviously, when Tony Elliott first came on to Virginia, he needed to build his staff. And that took a little while. So that's why I always tell my subscribers and those that read why I was 24-7 that, you know, they need to, you know, the old saying, pack your patience. They need to pack their patience right now because 2023 class is coming together slowly. I think a lot of people were a little in the panic mode a little bit when spring, there wasn't like continuing uh, commitments, but this staff, when they came on board, they needed to secure the 2022 class first. And then they had to go evaluate some more 2022 offensive linemen and try to get that class finished. So they were behind in the 23 class, you know, coach lamb wasn't able to go on the road and, you know, evaluate quarterbacks until the spring. That's why you've seen more new quarterback names kind of pop up during the evaluation period, like Anthony Colandrea, the quarterback out of Florida, who came for a multi-day visit and camped at UVA as well and has an offer right now. That's why. It's because a lot of these coaches weren't able to go on the road back then. So that's why during the spring evaluation period, I said, this is when you're going to see that 2023 board kind of put together. You're going to have the names that you expected on the board prior to that. You knew that Nicholas Harbor was going to be on there. You knew... Avery Johnson was going to be there. You, you knew some of the guys that were going to be recruited, like Kavion Keys out of Verina. Those are the guys that you knew they were going to be recruited. Virginia had a shot, but at the same time, you know, with Kavion Keys, you knew North Carolina and Penn State were going to be very big competitors for UVA. And honestly, it was going to be hard for UVA to lure him away out of state, although they did get him to visit. That's the big thing with this staff. They've been getting a lot of guys to visit grounds, and it's just about creating momentum. So after the spring evaluation period, that's when the recruiting starting to pick up. And you've seen a lot of guys come on official visits. Now, the, the big thing for me that I like what Tony Elliott and the staff have done is not overwhelm the visitors with a lot of visitors on grounds at the same time. Now, a lot of them, it's small visitor lists, which a lot of people, again, might have panicked. But because they're only taking about 15 guys in this class, it worked for them. You know, in the last visitor, visitor weekend, they only had three visitors together. They had Ronnie Laura, who committed last Friday. They had Cameron Robinson, a good linebacker out of Tappahannock, Virginia, who just was at Virginia Tech over the weekend. And they also had um, Caleb Woodson, a very good safety linebacker, also visiting from Battle, Battlefield, Virginia. So they had three really good guys. Um, and that was really helped them. I think it actually really helped them with Caleb Woodson, who I would have picked Virginia Tech about a month ago. So they did a really good job of, and I think it's actually UVA and Wake Forest have done a good job where I think those two, I would give them a slight edge. I think Virginia Tech is was is still the favorite, so you can't discount them, but those three are the schools, and I think UVA and Wake Forest did well. So I think Tony Allen and his staff are getting into a groove. It's going to take a while on the recruiting front, but it is moving. They've got nine commitments now, so if we're only getting 15, that's over half the class already, and it's, what, June 27th. So they're doing a good job on that front. As far as getting the team ready, a lot of guys on the team have said they love the new energy of the staff. They love their commitment to nutrition. That's something that even Tony Elliott said that he changed in the new facilities that broke ground. He wanted new things for the, for the players to have better access to nutrition, better access to dining. And so that was something that he wanted to add in the facilities before you know they, they broke ground. So a lot of the players like that. They're focused on nutrition, their, their difference in strength and conditioning. Brendan Armstrong said what he liked was they have a specific strength and conditioning coach for quarterbacks and specialists. So Brendan Armstrong now has a different regiment than the other guys. So he said, you know, I'm working to get faster and quicker. 
And I don't have to worry about bulking up and becoming slower. Like they're doing exercises. It's going to help me as a quarterback get better. And honestly, I've already had two quarterback recruits tell me that that was really something that stood out to them, including a 2025 quarterback, Ryan Montgomery, who visited, whose big brother plays at Ohio State. He's going to be a huge 2025 quarterback that wanted to visit Virginia, said he wants to come back. And one of the reasons why was that focus and the strength and conditioning room at quarterbacks. He didn't even mention Tony Elliott's resume when it comes to quarterbacks and the offenses. That was what really impressed them. And he said not many other Power 5 programs do that. So again, so there's things that are putting into place. Obviously, it's still early going. They haven't played one game yet, but things are moving forward to kind of create the culture that he wants. So then we're going to see how that translates. Obviously, there's a lot of questions going into the first game. You know, I hate giving coaches a grade. And after the only a couple months, either recruiting or team, because they haven't had their first class yet. They haven't evaluated yet. They haven't developed anybody yet. So, but everything's moving forward. I'm not going to ask you for a grade either because I, I'm, <laughs> I'm in the same, I, I'm right there with you. I just, I can't see how you can do that with somebody who's just started and you really don't see the product yet. So uh, Will's got a little breakdown of offense and defense. Let's take a look at that and, and, and see what's going on. That's new this year. Cause I, I'm sure there's lots of new things to talk about. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. But um Normally, I like to start uh, with quarterback and work my way down, but I want to I want to go reverse. I want to start on the offensive line because that is the biggest question I think for this football team this year. The entire offensive line is gone. Of of the ones that are returning, there's a grand total of two starters back. Obviously, uh, John Paul Flores will come in as a as a transfer. But and and you even mentioned this. So if you, if you watch the spring game, there were two players who had to play on both sides. They were so banged right. up for the spring practice. And you mentioned this. On your some on the summer school series of Bud Elliott, just how how bad it was during spring practice. So and there's not a lot of experience. So going into the spring, what is where do you see this offensive line going? Because it's it's a gigantic question mark, to be honest with you. And and honestly, it's still a gigantic question mark when you go into the fall because we still haven't seen what the starting five would look like in the spring. Because you know even when they had guys out there, you know for example Derek Devine, he didn't play in the spring game because he was injured and I assume he would be one of the you know first guys on the field in the O-line and so they had to take extra reps I think that's going to really help them come the fall because they took so many reps I think guys like Noah Josie really started to develop a lot better and they were playing uh, you know as the spring got they got better um Jonathan Leach is one that I think people really need to keep an eye on because I think he's going to be one that's going to really step and have a breakout season on the O-line but again we don't know what this O line is going to look yet. Um, we couldn't really evaluate them in the spring game because, again, both sides are playing. You know, there I think three of them were on both sides, and then some of them were walk-ons who came on and helped. So we don't know yet. And then what I'm interested in seeing is how they might help with Grant Mish kind of sliding in there and kind of helping as well because. I see him more of that, you know, blocking tight end. And I think he's going to really help them establish a good running game. If you look back to game film last year, a lot of the times that Brendan Armstrong was running, you would see Grant Mish coming in off a key block. So I would see kind of seeing how much he's going to be used until the offensive line is a little bit more, uh, I guess, more experienced and more veteran. Like it's nice that they start the way they start into the season. I think the first couple of games is going to help them. Obviously, they go on the road to Illinois, but I think the first couple of games is going to help this offense come together, especially that O-line. And my goodness, they really lucked out by having Brendan Armstrong back because when you have an O-line that's not experienced, having an experienced signal caller that can unleash that ball quickly is going to be a huge benefit. So the other, the second biggest question off, on offense is running back. Obviously, with the new offense, they want to have a little more balance with the offense as opposed to Brennan Armstrong doing, you know, throwing everything. for a thousand yards. Yeah, basically right. everything. So I mean, there's names there. Obviously, a lot of people have been high on Mike Collins for a couple of years now, and he's finally going to get an opportunity. Uh, they just brought in a transfer, Greg Brown from Miami. Maybe Ronnie Walker, depending on the on his injuries. So, where do you do you expect the kind of Hollins to be the guy to start, or do you see multiple guys getting carries to start? That's actually my big position battle heading into the fall. That was one of the first ones I highlighted was because I think the running back room is really up for grabs. I feel really bad for Ronnie Walker. I think he would have been the number one back if he was healthy. 
Um, I, 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 right now it looks like he's going to miss fall camp. That's what was alluded by Virginia head coach Tony Elliott during after spring. Um, and I saw Ronnie during the summer camps and it didn't look like he was going to be ready for the fall camp. If you just see how he's progressing on the field. I, I, so right now I do think the Miami transfer is one that I would keep an eye on as a possible number one, just because from everything I've heard from guys from university of Miami, they all said the same thing. Listen, he was really good. It's just Miami has so much, so many talented running backs on that depth chart. He just wasn't going to get reps. It wasn't a knock on him. It's just that they have four or five star running backs on that depth chart. So they said that this was a huge win for UVA. Actually, I thought it was quite strange that didn't get as much traction. Um, when I posted the commitment on Twitter, it didn't it seemed like UVA fans didn't realize how big of a win this was for Tony Elliott to grab a guy of that caliber to come to Virginia. And I think it's going to be him and Mike Collins. Um, honestly, um, you know, I think even, you know, Faustin, maybe a guy, I really, I thought he really improved, uh, Paris Jones is another guy that I thought showed a lot of good flashes during the spring game. And I think I, 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 you know, I've heard a lot of good things about PJ from, you know, those in within the UVA program. Collins is one that I'm interested in to see because the former staff, when you're speaking to those, you know, prior to the change of staff and the other UVA program, he was, he, they always said that he was a talented running back. One of the things they wanted him to improve is his pass protection and becoming an all around running back. In the spring game, I saw, and towards the end of the last season too, I did see improvement in that from Holland. So, you know, I think we see some pass protection and some blocking that he has done better in. So my question is how much better is he now? Um, I think it's going to be, I think Brown and Hollins are my two running backs that I would watch for to really kind of kick up for it to start the season. But I wouldn't be shocked if it was really running back by committee, honestly, for Virginia until they kind of cement something. And I also wouldn't knock Mr. Football himself, Keaton Thompson, running the ball too. I think, I think the staff is really excited about what KT can bring to this offense. And you just told me that was my next question was Keaton, <laughs> Keaton taking carry. So th- thanks for, I'm, I'm not surprised to be honest. And, and you, you touched on something that goes unnoticed with William Talapapa's departure is he was really good in pass pro. And yes. that, that was something that Hollins, as you mentioned, wasn't as nearly as good at, but you know, you got to work on it. Whoever's going to do best, especially with this new offense with, with the amount of receivers that can catch the ball. I mean, you got to, you got to help give Brennan time and let's go to that wide receiver core because they are absolutely stagged. I, I think they're the deepest in the league. We mentioned Thompson, Dontavian Wicks, a guy who had over 1,200 yards last year. Mm-hmm. Billy Kemp, a great slot receiver. And we get and people are forgetting Lavelle Davis is back up after missing right. last year. And he had what 25 yards to catch, I think it was in mm-hmm. 2020. Um, so let's just start with him. Where um, how, do you plan? Do you see them easing him in coming off such a severe injury? Yeah, you know, with him, you know, in the spring, you saw them easing him in. Um, he has to work on his game conditioning. And he, he even said that one of the things that he liked was the stuff focused on nutrition and strength and conditioning. And he, you know, one thing that he said was that he would start off well, you know, when he was recovering and then he would kind of go and stray away from it. And that's something that he personally was working on to stay focused on his nutrition and his conditioning so that he can prevent injuries rather than work on that after he's gotten hurt. That's something that he's been really focused on. And I think that's something that he said he wanted to do, especially during the summer workouts. I could see Lavelle working his well, working his way into the ones. Malachi Fields was one name that really popped up during spring, especially early on when Lavelle was easing his way. As spring continued on, you saw what, you know, a second year player would do some mistakes here and there, more reps when things started to get a little bit more fierce on the field. He wasn't you know, as crisp as you saw him before in the first two, three practices, but he is definitely going to push Lavelle to be better. And I think that's the key thing of this wide receiver room is that everyone is pushing everyone to be better. And if I was an opposing defense, I want to know which wide receivers are going to be lined up in a given time. And what's so great about this wide receiver group is if you look at each wide receiver, they're each bring their own quality to the game where if you want someone in that Renzo, cause they don't have Jelani Woods anymore. They don't have that six foot seven monster there to pick up a pass. You can get the Tavian Wicks and Lavelle Davis, the ball in the end zone, and they will try to find a way to get that ball. How many incredible passes have we seen Wicks catch last year just by him 
on his tiptoes, grabbing one hand and bringing in. Those are the type of throws that Brendan Armstrong might have to do with an inexperienced O-line. So those are the guys that I could see being those prime targets, those big guys in the end zone. Then you see, like you said, Billy Camp, he's, he's probably one of the most consistent wide receivers that UVA has. He can do wonders in the slot. Then you see Malachi Fields, who is such a speedster wide receiver, and I think he could really get some extra yardage after the catch. So he's, every single wide receiver has a strength that UVA could utilize on the offense. I'm curious to see how this offense is going to change under Tony Elliott and Coach Kitchings and how they can kind of incorporate these wide receivers because, again, again, they have all the skilled players. This is a very exciting offense. And honestly, if this O-line was as experienced as last year, I would be saying this is a team that can compete for the Coastal. So because of that O-line, I'm hesitant to kind of go that far and kind of agree with Vegas with the seven and a half prediction. So, but yeah, it's, it's really interesting to see that the former staff did a really good job. Obviously coach Hagan still on the staff. They did a good job recruiting wide receivers that had special skill set and making them different. So right now they can really, depending on the package that they're running, they can really utilize a different wide receiver and Keaton obviously can, you know, come in as a wild in the wildcat. He can catch a pass. He can definitely get yards after the catch. We've seen that he takes about five guys to bring him down. So that's another one. Um, and he's also a really good blocker. That's another thing that wide receivers, you know, you, you focus on the catches, you focus on all that, but Keaton will be, is an all around good player. He will give you the block. I still remember to this day that Miami game, he was on the opposite side of the field. He ran back 10 yards, got the block. And then Brendan Armstrong got the first down. And then I think two plays later, they scored a touchdown in Miami. That's the sort of player that Keaton is. So I think that's the depth that they have a wide receiver. It's a real credit to him and to Marcus Higgins that he has taken to the wide receiver position just so quickly and has become so good at it so quickly. And I didn't even mention the transfer from Wisconsin. Who's yeah, a, Chandler, so, yeah. Chandler, so I didn't even mention Devin Chandler, but yeah, they have a lot of good talent in that wide receiver. So, so we're not expecting offensive linemen to catch pass, passes this year. <laughs> I, God, I hope not. <laughs> I can't, yeah. I can't, I can't handle another it's it's uh, handle another it's, message board meltdown <laughs> no i can't i think i think uh after that game i i have to create an own thread post to say <laughs> this is your venting post after the virginia tech loss any i will not moderate this thread so please don't tell me don't report any post this is your venting thread <laughs> anything you want to say i will not hold against you just put it here <laughs> all okay. right big question and uh Let's just get this out of the way now. Brennan Armstrong, Heisman. Hey. Is there a push on the part of Virginia Athletics, supporters, et cetera? And oh, it's definitely think- supporters. Oh, okay. oh, definitely. Definitely supporters. They, if you ask anybody, they, they say that Brennan Armstrong is being ignored by the national media. I get that. I really, really do. If you look at his stats, incredible what Brendan Armstrong can do. I love Brendan Armstrong's mentality. I absolutely love the fact that he does not care to put his body on the line. He's an incredible quarterback and incredible, incredible athlete, but I understand the hesitation to put him as a Heisman favorite. Um, One for right there, Jackie. Yeah. Explain to us why you understand the hesitation because I under, okay. yeah. I, you know i now i'm think i'm thinking i probably am thinking the same thing as you are but it's good to say it out loud yeah so i i understand because when you look at the bigger picture again brendan armstrong is a talented guy i i just said that i think they're gonna agree with vegas they're only gonna win maybe seven to eight games so you're gonna have an eight game season possibly for uva is that enough for Heisman voters to get notice of Brennan Armstrong. The other thing is that I think, you know, Jim Phillips in the ACC needs to really take notice of all the good quarterbacks in the ACC and help promote the fact that they have good quarterbacks. I think that is something that the ACC has not done to help the conference promote the great quarterbacks. When you look at what Miami's, you know, Tyler Van Dyke, you look at Hartman, you look at all these great quarterbacks, where's the ACC in promoting them? So that is one thing that I think because they don't promote them as well, that is also a knock on Brendan Armstrong. UVA can also do a better job of promoting. They did a good job of promoting Brendan Armstrong towards the end of last season, but that's probably a little too late, especially considering that he didn't play against Notre Dame and he was hurt for half the BYU game. And at that point, once he lost to Pitt, 
the whole conversation changed. So he, they weren't going for, you know, the coastal at that point, they didn't have a chance mathematically. So the conversation changed. So when they're, I think if I, I, I did a breakdown of the games and what I thought, which games, I think early on in the season is when you start to promote Brennan Armstrong. But at the end of the day, when you look at what UVA has, their O-line questions, you look at the last few games of the season, my goodness, that is rough. Uh, when you look at how they end the season, it's going to be hard for Ben Armstrong to be a Heisman contender, especially early on. So that's why I'm saying I understand why he's not on the Heisman pre-list. And at the end of the day, do you want to be on the list before the season or after the season? So before the season, I completely understand why you got the O-line questions. You've got the second half of the season for UVA that is quite frankly a gauntlet. Um, and again, the ACC is not promoting the quarterbacks, nor did UVA do in the beginning of the season last year. They waited until they were almost mathematically out of it. So those are my big questions. Can they promote the quarterbacks? Well, and if the O-line is great, I mentioned all the good skilled players that UVA has in wide receivers that changes the game. So, but right now I understand why the national media isn't giving Brennan Armstrong much attention. Uh, I, I think overall, this is a, this is an issue among some of the schools. And um, also, the, as you point out, the ACC as a whole does not do a very good job at, at promoting the players on a national scale. Um, and a good example of that is I'm not going to name the school because we're not talking about the school, but it's to our south. And they had a player go from there further south and suddenly became overnight a Heisman candidate and it's right. it's like what <laughs> and right. it, it all comes right back to the school and to the conference so I, yeah I got a little beef there and, and you you just you lit a match under me man I mean <laughs> I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to stop right there because if, <laughs> it, it could get a little uh, I'm going to become cantankerous now. Yeah, we'll get, <laughs> we'll, we'll get into this in a, in a, in a few moments. Uh, but, um, I noticed that, and here's, here's something else that Jackie does a great job of. She, she always has some great video that runs down stuff. And one of the things that, that I was watching uh, recently was, uh, you were talking about Vegas and, and you mentioned it seven and a half games. Uh, and you also talked about what your thoughts were on the schedule. We'll get into that here in a couple of minutes um, as we as we wrap up the show, because I, wa I want to look at this schedule. And again, maybe 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 I can tweak your thoughts on <laughs> the schedule just a little bit. But let's let's take a look at the defense and see how that, that that's going. Well, <laughs> Well, I, I figure I figure it can't get any worse than last year. Personally, <laughs> no, no, but... <laughs> no, no, it can't, it can't. It can't get any worse. No, not at all. And, and honestly, I think they the defense got a lot of heat last year, and uh, deservedly so. I'm not saying that they didn't yeah. get deserved so, but I think a lot of there's a. I personally had a lot of questions on why certain players weren't on the field. Um, especially younger players weren't on the field. And I think when you look at those younger players, they should be on the field this year. So that's why I have a little less questions on the quarterback than you, you would might expect. Mm -hmm. So uh, new defensive coordinator, John Radzinski, he comes over from air force. They were top five defense last year and, you know, obviously did a really good job there, but, and one of the things you're look, you in talking to him, you mentioned, you know, they, you know, bringing in a guy with a military background, you know, from a military school discipline. Right. However, I also look at UNC doing the same thing. They brought in Jay Bateman when Mac Brown was hired and that didn't work. So I have concerns that, you know, just because, you know, you have that background, it's that it's, it's not a guarantee to work in, in my opinion. Yeah, no, that's, and, and you know, you've got a lot of different reservations when it comes to bringing a coach with a military background. Uh, can they, you know, re resonate with the players that he's recruiting? It's definitely a different environment and different recruiting rules. I think a lot of people don't understand there's different recruiting rules if you're recruiting for an army or a navy compared to recruiting for a UVA or UNC or Virginia Tech. You have more flexibility on seeing guys on campus if you're coming from a service academy, you're, you're able to have more face-to-face -face time with these guys. So there's a lot of stuff that goes, so there's a lot of reservations and I understand the, some of the thoughts that people have. One of the things though, with a coach Rudd brings is his stats 
of his defenses are pretty good. Um, it's always among the top in the nation. And I think what he's brought to UVA, and I, I think a lot of people are going to be excited about this, is he focused on tackling a lot in the spring. Um, I remember going to the, they opened up about three practices for us. And, and then also the spring game, they had focused on tackling every single practice. They worked on, basically they went back to fundamentals and they're like, we're focusing on this. You're wrapping guys around. Thank you. Wrapping guys around before you, before you tackle, you're not just going in there and kind of just put your hands on them. You're wrapping around them and bringing them down. So that's, those are the things that they were working on. So I think fundamentally and that discipline aspect, because sometimes I felt they just didn't, they lacked a little bit of discipline. Um, so that's something that they needed to kind of hone in on. But again, I alluded to this earlier, also the talent. So coach Radzinski is going to have good young talent, good young talent that I feel like some of these guys are finally going to be put in positions to succeed. Like Deshaun Perry. I always felt like Deshaun Perry should be a guy that comes off the edge that's where his strength was. And he was being placed in space, which I didn't think was a good spot for him. He's a guy that you're going to see more off the edge. You're also going to see guys like Chico Bennett, who was hurt last year. He's going to be a guy who's going to play in that bandit position. He's another guy that I think is going to have a breakout season. And then Jameer Carter is doing having, you know, a lot of people kept saying that they like his development up front. I think coach Rudd has a lot of good guys on this team. A lot of young guys. It's going to take, a little while to see them develop. And obviously they're going to put a new scheme in, but I think Bronco Mendenhall and Nick Howell's big downfall was changing the scheme before they had the personnel that fit the scheme. That was their big problem. They also went with seniority over anything else. Like, I think that's the big thing. You know, I've heard that countless of times that they went with guys that just had experience or guys that would win them for so long. I think that's been the biggest downfall for their defense last year. This year, they're not going to have that. These are That's the good thing about bringing new staff over. You don't have those preconceived notions about who should be my starter because you don't have that. You have guys really playing for their position. And I think they have enough talent. I'm interested to see how the secondary is going to look. Because again, I think that group got overly criticized was when you look back at some of the film, sometimes, yes, they missed, had missed tackles, but sometimes it was another guy out of position and then they were scrambling to catch up and make that last minute tackle. And I think you're missing the linebackers that might've been out of position. You're missing some of the front when they didn't rush more than three guys up front. You're, there's a lot of things that happen. It's not just the secondary. That was the issue. And I think they got overly criticized because of it. Um, but they have a lot of good young secondary guys coming forward, like Antonio Clary. I'm really, really excited to see what Antonio Clary can bring to this defense. And they also did a good job in a transfer portal as well, bringing like guys like Paul Kier and Cam Butler to reinforce their friends and obviously Devonte Davis too from South Carolina. So they have good guys that they kind of brought in on the transfer portal. I think they did a really great job in the portal as far as the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, and especially up front, because I feel like D-line depth has been a problem for two, three years. And loading yes. up with the portal, as you mentioned, with guys on the D-line, I think that's going to make a huge difference. And, and, and you, having and you, Aaron yeah. Louie back, too. That's right. And you've noticed, too, that in the recruiting, they really focused on that D-line. They picked up Miles Green, a break pair from a Highland Springs. Um, and they really folk Rodney Laura again, another D lineman, and they're still working on getting a bandit guy. Uh, Jordan Cruz is one option, obviously after some much Turner committed to Duke over UVA. Um, so they're re- they noticed that they've, they said, you know what, we need to reinforce that D line. And it wouldn't shock me if they go to a transfer portal again <laughs> next year for on, on D line. So um, yeah, they, they, they realized that they, they, they noticed that was a weakness in there and they immediately went to attack it. All right, Jackie, let's uh, run through this schedule here very quickly. Now you've given your opinion on this. Mm-hmm. Vegas has given their opinion on this. I want to see if I can tweak you a little bit. As I mentioned, okay. let's talk about uh, briefly um, Richmond, Illinois, ODU, Syracuse, Duke. I think that's a run. You I think they that- can run. Okay. I, I think that you said there might be a little bit of a question in. I think Illinois is my, the one that I had a little bit of a question in and Syracuse are okay. two on the road, the okay. two on the road games. Um, the last staff had a problem on the road. And I think those are the two that I think can be the question marks there. I think they win it. I think they win Richmond. And I think um, they, the two home games, ODU and Richmond, I think. And then I think they even would beat it. Do I think that right now UVA has a better roster than Duke. 
Okay. Now Syracuse, Syracuse and that's, that's, I, I Robert and I and James, that's a great storyline, but I, mm-hmm. I think Illinois is going to be the one that I question. Yeah. Yeah. And personally with me, with uh, Syracuse, they have, you know, Sean Tucker's a great back, but I don't trust Robert and I to use them right. Oh, well, there's an O-lineman, right? They're going to cast Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's the joke it, that never is going to end. It's no, yeah. I'm not, I don't think I'm, it's going to get old. Yeah. I'm not letting you two ever be in the same room again. So, uh, <laughs> and, and you're not, but that's besides the point. Same Zoom call. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Here's, here's where I, I may take some exception with what you, you yeah. picked Louisville. I'm looking at a home advantage as just enough to pull the cat out of the bag here. Yeah, that one, that one was a toss up for me. I just thought that Louisville did such an excellent job in a transfer portal. For me, I think that one is one where I can see a close Louisville win um, just because I think Louisville is a little, like when you look at the talent on your side, if it's a close game, I edge out Louisville because you got that one exceptional play, one exceptional player. I always give that, that, edge to that team um and i'm curious to see because right now i'm concerned at depth at certain positions at uva i believe louisville just before a bye week too so it's just when i'm like you know what i i could see that one be the first loss i got you i and, and part of the reason why i'm going here with uva uh i thoroughly look at, at louisville and i go there's i think there's more talent there i think there's much more potential but I have been at Scott stadium enough and seen teams of similar superior quality come in and lose. And it's hello Miami. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. (laughs) There's something, there is something about Scott stadium on the right day that it's, it's gloom and doom for teams to come to visit. Then next you have an open, then you're at Georgia tech. I, I had, I have UVA over Georgia tech in that one. Yeah. The only question is, is Jeff Collins going to be the coach then? <laughs> yeah, I think that's what Jackie also had alluded to yeah. in the video. Yeah. Now, as you said earlier in our uh, in our interview, the end of the schedule is tough, and it is. It's yeah. Miami, North Carolina, Pitt. But now, again, all of them at home, so there's a possibility yes. somebody's going to stumble here. Yeah, and I think I mentioned I could see at least one of the one of the wins there. I like. Every time I see North Carolina and Miami, not so much Pitt, I always see Miami and North Carolina at home at Scott Stadium, like VA can win both of those. <laughs> Just because, you know, everyone who knows me, I'm a University of Miami uh, alumnus, and I saw that Orange Bowl game. That was my senior year, the Orange Bowl, where UVA came and oh. stopped uh, UVA in the Orange Bowl. And at, when I started off my career, I covered UVA, and I never saw UV, uh, Miami beat UVA at Scott Stadium. I've never seen that covering. Every time I've covered a game, UVA versus Miami, I've never seen Miami beat UVA at Scott Stadium. And there's just something about Scott Stadium for Miami. Obviously, this is a different, I've seen, I, I've seen several coaches. I've seen Al Golden, I've seen Mark Rick, I've seen all these coaches. So it's not a coach thing, but I can see UVA pulling out fourth, at least one between North Carolina and Miami. And I can see them pulling both. Um, it's just for me, I, it, it depends on how healthy this team is. That's why I'm a little hesitant because the second half of the season and those teams should be fighting, especially Miami should be fighting for a coastal. But again, I could see, I can see at least one win. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Then coastal Carolina at home that. I, I said UVA. Yeah. It's expected UVA, but. Yeah. Uh, it, it should be. Now here's the one that, that will make all of the Wahoo fans very excited. And, uh, you know, since Will is, is sort of prone to being a Virginia fan, uh, make sure that he's on screen here. When you say the final game of the season will be going to. I picked UVA. Virginia <laughs> tech. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I think, I think UVA again has more, but be- uh, last year I thought UVA had its, best shot to be Virginia Tech. I think this year they still have a shot because of who they had returning on offense. It's just, again, it's the second half of the season, how their depth looks. You're hoping that everything is clicked into place. And again, if you look at that, who returned for UVA and who returned for Virginia Tech, I, I think UVA has a shot on this year. I think this is another year where they have a shot. The only thing is it is on the road. So, but uh, 
I, I, I went on a limb, you know, I, I, I picked UVA. Indeed. Hey, you can take ACC Nation with you by subscribing to our podcast. Worldwide listeners can listen to ACC Nation radio streaming 24-7. And you can watch the program on YouTube. Pick one or more of your favorite options and subscribe to ACC Nation. Thank you so much to our special guest, Jackie Franchuli, publisher of Wahoo's 24-7 and host of the good old podcast. Be sure to follow her on Twitter and subscribe to 24sports.com for all the best coverage of the Virginia Cavaliers. Thank you, Jackie, for joining us. No, thanks for having me. And I look forward to all those notifications for Virginia Tech fans on my Twitter. (laughs) 